Let's take our Bibles and turn to Philippians chapter number 3. Philippians chapter number 3. As we come this morning to the end of our series here on chains, we're asking the Lord Jesus Christ to set us free from anything that might have us in bondage. We spent the last three weeks talking about being chained to food and alcohol and drugs, and uh, these can cause a lot of problems in people's hearts and lives, have a lot of repercussions that can be long-lasting, not just for your own personal life, but many times for generations to come. And so it is important for us to know and to understand that we can be set free from all things. There's nothing that Jesus cannot give you freedom from. There's nothing that he will not give you power to overcome. But we have to do things with his power in his strength and in his way. Philippians chapter number 3 Beginning in verse number 17, let's read it again. He says, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk, so as ye have us for an example. And we ought to be so thankful for the good examples that we have to follow in life. He says, For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that They are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. And the scripture is very clear that there are a lot of bad examples out there. Uh, it's, It's easy to find somebody doing the wrong thing, going the wrong way. It's hard, especially in our society, and it's getting increasingly harder to find somebody who's trying to live right and do right according to what the Scripture says. You find somebody who's doing what the Scripture says, then mark them and try to follow the example, because there are a lot of people out there that will lead us in a way that we should not go. And he tells us their God, in verse 19, is their belly whose glory is in their shame, and notice this, that they mind earthly things. All they care about is the here and now. You find somebody who only cares about the here and now, and you'll find somebody who's walking contrary to the cross of Christ, because Jesus was all about what comes next. Because this world pales in comparison to the world and the life to come. This is but for a moment, but that which is to come is everlasting. And he tells us that as Christians, I mean, if you're here today and you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, he expects us to live a certain way. This morning in our Elevate group, we talked about the fact that we are to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, that that is to be the top priority of our life. Unfortunately, even as Christians, many times we're just concerned with the earthly things, just like those who are the enemies of the cross of Christ. And he says, listen, we need to live differently because our conversation, our life, is not in the here and now. It's in heaven, verse number 20 tells us. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And one of the things that ought to encourage us to live right, to do right, to be set free from these things that have us in bondage, is a day is coming where Jesus is going to return. It was promised that just like you saw him go, you're going to see him return. He is physically, bodily coming back to this earth, and we are going to stand before him. What a shame for him to come and to find his followers wrapped in chains of sin and addictions and filth and the things of this world when he's come that we might be free. And so he challenges us here and states that he's going to change our vile body. Man, I look forward to that day because this body is sinful and there are a lot of struggles that come just from this flesh itself. 
Most of my problem has nothing to do with the world, has nothing to do with culture, has nothing to do with the devil. I doubt that in my lifetime I will ever come face to face and have the devil tempt me with anything. My biggest struggle is me, is my human flesh. And man, I look forward to the day where he's going to change this vile, filthy, sinful body and it's going to be fashioned, as verse number 21 says, like unto his glorious body. And he says, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. And that's what we're asking him to do through this series. Okay, so maybe you're not struggling with food, alcohol, or drugs. Maybe your struggle is not with pornography like we're going to talk about here this morning. Maybe your struggle and the thing that has you chained is something else, and we've not really touched on it, but you know what it is. You know the thing that has you in chains, and I want you to understand, looking at all these different things that we've looked at, is Jesus is able to subdue all things to himself. Even those things that we feel like, I just can't get victory over, I just can't beat this sin, this habit, this addiction, it just controls and conquers and dominates my life. You've got to change the way that you think. Because He is able to subdue all things to Himself. And He is able to subdue your addiction to pornography as well. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that You would help us now. As we look at this very serious, very difficult and troublesome topic. Lord, so many lives that have been lost and ruined, so many relationships that have been destroyed because we have given ourselves over to sexual sins. And Lord, we pray that you would forgive us, that you would wash us and make us clean and help us to be the pure and holy people that you desire us to be. And Lord, if there are those in the auditorium here, those who are watching online this morning that are enchained and enslaved to any sexual sin, God, I pray that they might find freedom that comes in you. It is possible to live a pure and a holy life with your power and your strength. But we need your help. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sex is a great thing in the right context. God created sex, so it is a good thing. But he created it with certain parameters to be enjoyed in certain boundaries and the scripture is very clear going all the way back to the very beginning as God created them male and female he said you're to leave father and mother and you're to be joined to your wife and they too shall be one flesh that includes sex but it includes a lot more than that and the scripture is very clear that sex is to be enjoyed between a husband and a wife together only you add anything else to that and it's sin. You take it before that, it's sin. You go anywhere out of those boundaries that he has established and he says it's wrong. And as is with any good thing and any pure thing, the devil wants to pollute it. And my, has he polluted it. And he did right from the very start going all the way back to the very beginning of Genesis, and you see how quickly sex became polluted. And even these great men and women of the faith, man, struggled mightily in this area of their lives. We've got, uh, right away, you find polygamy never condoned in Scripture. God created male and female, two, for one life. That's what the scripture says, and Jesus even related that as well. So even though the scripture doesn't necessarily come down hard and condemn what's going on in society, it doesn't mean it's right either. So you look at Abraham and others who struggled with polygamy. You look at Samson, man, his parents, man, the shame and the heartache. They said, listen, is there 
never a woman among your own people the way that God has established it to be going into prostitutes and all this sort of filth and really his lack of self-control in the area of sex is what brought Samson down. And then man, we think about if there's one person, one man that could escape this sin, it would be the man after God's own heart. Not the case. King David struggled and fell in the area of sex as he made a, a time, okay, the time when kings go forth to battle and David stays home. The traditional time that women would go on the roof and bathe themselves because the water had been heating in the sun all day. They would go up in the evening just before dark and they would wash themselves. David finds himself up on the roof. There he sees Bathsheba. And he looks at her, he lusts after her, he commits adultery, and then he commits murder to cover up his wicked sexual sin. And if David, the man after God's own heart, can fall in this area, you better believe that every single one of us can. You can fall, I can fall, we can all fall into this trap. And as we look at the statistics, many of us are and have fallen into this trap. Statistics are usually pretty boring, but I want you to understand the severity of the problem that is in front of us. We're going to focus specifically on pornography here this morning, but you can put any sexual perversion outside of what God has intended and what He has commanded in its place, but as far as pornography is concerned, there's uh, some research done by the Barna Group and Covenant Eyes and uh, that tell us over 40 million Americans are regular visitors to porn sites. There are around 42 million of these sites, around 370 million pages of pornography on the internet. The annual revenue of the porn industry is more than the NFL, NBA, and Major League Baseball combined. It's more than the combined revenues of ABC, CBS, and NBC as well. And 47% of families in the United States reported that pornography is a problem in their home. That's nearly half in our country today. And increases the marital infidelity rate by more than 300% for those who indulge in pornography. 11 is the average age that a child is first exposed to pornography. 94% of children will see porn by the age of 14. Man, what a shame. It's a huge problem in our world and it is growing increasingly larger with the ease of access. Used to be you had to go into a public place and, and ask for it. You had to come face to face with somebody in order to access that filth, whether on the page or on a video. But now we have access to it everywhere we go. 70% of Christian youth pastors report that they have had at least one teen come to them for help in dealing with pornography in the last 12 months. That's just the one that came forward for help. 68% of church-going men and over 50% of pastors view porn on a regular basis. Of young Christian adults, 18 to 24 years old, 76% actively search for porn. 59% of pastors said that married men seek their help for porn use. 33% of women aged 25 and under searched for porn at least once per month. Only 13% of self-identified Christians, so we're not just talking about Baptists, but anyone who calls themselves a Christian, only 13% of self-identified Christian women say they've never watched porn. That's 87% have watched it. 
55% of married men and 25% of married women say they watch porn at least once a month. And that's just those who say and who admit to it. See, it's not just the, the world. It's not just the nation. It's the church as well. We've got a serious problem that is taking place when the Scripture tells us that fornication is not to be once named among you as a Christian. See, fornication is any sex outside of what God has created. Whether it's what we do with our bodies, what we think with our minds, what we listen to with our ears, or what we watch and look at with our eyes. That's what fornication is. Paul, in writing to the churches, said it's not once to be named among you. That we are to flee and run from fornication, but rather than running from this sin, we indulge and give ourselves over to it. The problem comes because we make certain choices. Sometimes things happen by accident and that stirs things up and then we make a choice to seek after it. See, a lot of times we don't make a choice about what comes in front of our face. Don't necessarily make a choice about what's on the billboard, what's on the magazine rack as we check out, what commercial comes on the football game as we're watching it. We don't necessarily make a choice about that. We make a choice from that moment forth. Once that content reaches our face, then we make a choice. We make a choice either to turn away and try to avoid it, or we make a choice to look to it and indulge ourselves in it. And based upon the choice that we make, we are setting up certain patterns and literally giving ourselves over to be enchained and enslaved to pornography and immorality. A lot of studies have been done in this area, and there's a lot of people, secular people that have nothing to do with Christianity that understand the damage that pornography does to an individual's life and to their brain and to their thinking. Pornography affects the brain like a drug. We have a reward sensor in our brain that will give us a rush of chemicals to feel good as a reward for certain behaviors. Okay, so you eat a food that is enjoyable to you, it tastes good, this reward sensor goes off, and these chemicals flood into your brain and give you that sense of pleasure that you enjoy. Certain foods that we all enjoy more than one another. Okay, you can get that sensation after a hard work, a hard workout. After sex, among other things. Remember, sex is not a bad thing in the right context. But our brain is designed to release those chemicals and then shut off. Okay, so that moment ends. But see, drugs keep the switch from turning off. We talked about drugs last week. They, they don't let that pleasure sensor turn off. Okay, so you grow accustomed to a certain level. That's why you have to do more drugs to get that same rush, that same high is the terminology that's often used. You've got to indulge deeper and deeper and deeper. Well, pornography is the same way in our brains as is drugs. So you may think of it as something harmless, something pleasurable, and you have that very natural sensation of pleasure that your mind releases. Okay, but then you've got to see more and you've got to see more and you've got to see more graphic and indulge even more to have that same sort of rush and feeling in your life. In fact, there are a number of men and there's an increasing problem with men being able to perform even in the marital sense because they no longer get that same feeling and that same rush it just doesn't work anymore and so you can get so addicted to pornography you feel symptoms of withdrawal just like any drug addict would take away heroin from a heroin addict and the withdrawal symptoms that they go through can be the same symptoms that someone who's trying to fight and get away from pornography 
will feel and will go through. Speaking of our brain, which is a wonderful creation, used to believe that after you passed adolescence that our brains kind of just remain the same. That your brain is fully, fun- fully formed and that's just the way that it was. They now know that our brains are constantly changing and creating new pathways and new routes all the time, rewiring themselves based upon our choices and upon our actions. Every time that we do something new, maybe like play an instrument, okay, that creates a pathway in our brain. And uh, that pathway is kind of like walking through the woods. Okay, you walk through the woods one time, okay, it can be kind of difficult to get through certain places. You've got to walk through the thorns and the bushes and everything else. As that path has continued to travel, okay, it gets wider, it gets deeper. You can see the path that's being traveled, and it's a lot easier to travel. So you pick up a new instrument, you learn a new language, whatever it is. The path starts out very small, and that's why it can be so hard to learn to pick up these different instruments and different things. But we have some very talented musicians here with us. Many of them, we don't even need to just say, hey, play the song. They don't even need music. They can sit down at the piano and just very beautifully play and arrange and, and... off the fly. Why? Because they've built a pathway that their mind just remembers and they can go back to it. That's why they say practice makes perfect. And uh, we do that same thing in this area as well. Okay, so we have that pleasure sensor that we, we, we talked about that releases those chemicals. One of the chemicals that is released is called Delta Fos B. I'd never heard of this before. I prepared for this message. But as we think about that that pathway through the woods, okay, Delta Foss B is like releasing an army with uh, chainsaws and equipment to clear the path and to maintain it. So as we look at pornography and, and other sexual sins as well, Not only do we become addicted like in a drug sense because we want that sensation and that feel good, but the pathway in our mind becomes entrenched and ingrained in such a way because our mind says, hey, this feels good, let's remember how we got here. And so it creates these very deep, very uh, established pathways in our minds so what once started with a series of choices has quickly become a problem with our mind itself but the brain has very limited capacity so the pathways that are not being traveled eventually they grow back over and so the scripture tells us and turn with me to Ephesians chapter number uh, let's see, I didn't put the chapter down. Ephesians chapter number 4, I think it is. Ephesians 4. Notice what it says. Verse number 22. It says that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. So what he's trying to say is, hey, it's time to put those old pathways behind. Okay, you used to think this way, you used to live this way. As a Christian, that's not the way you're to, to think anymore. That's not the way you're to behave anymore. There is to be a change. It's time to put those old pathways aside. And he says in verse 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. See, that's where the battle takes place for almost everything that we struggle with. It takes place right up in here here in our minds. Why? Because of certain choices that we make, they establish these strongholds. And he says you need to get rid of that old way of thinking and that old way of living, and you need to be renewed. And he says, well, how how am I renewed in the spirit of my mind? He continues on, and he says that you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. And so maybe you're here and you have 
been struggling with pornography for years, maybe decades of your life, and this pathway in your mind is so ingrained and so entrenched. I mean, you have got the superhighway of all superhighways in your mind to this corruption and this filth. But you can be renewed. can be changed. Because just like anything else, you know, there's a lot of things that we learn in life that at one point was important for one reason or another. And we can bring up all these facts and do all these different things. What do they say? If you don't use it, you lose it. And there's a lot of things that I used to be able to recall to my mind that I don't recall anymore because I don't use it. I remember taking music classes when I was a kid and playing the recorder and all those things and knowing what note was where on the staff. You know what? If my life depended on it right now, I might be able to tell you what the spaces are, but I might get them backwards because I don't, I don't really use it. So it's lost. That pathway has overgrown, and I don't know, and I don't think about that information anymore. And the same is true in this era of your life as well. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. As we think about these highways and these pathways that we make in our minds, it's amazing to me the relevance of Scripture in light of what we continue to find out in science. The Scripture is true every single time and science continues to Prove that the scripture is true. Look at verse number 3 of 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. It says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Okay, it's not a physical fight that we're in, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And I would encourage you to look, circle that word strongholds. One famous pastor says this thing about strongholds, that they are fortified patterns of thinking. And I like the way that he puts that. So that's exactly what they are. That's what these habits, these addictions, whether it's the pornography or anything else, that's exactly what they are. It's a fortified pattern of thinking. You have, I have established these super highways, pathways in our minds that are ingrained and entrenched with this filth because of the choices that we have made. So he says we need to pull down these strongholds. And notice what he says in verse number 5, and it all has to do with the way that we think. He says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. See, it all has to do with your thinking, with your mind, that's how we tear down the strongholds. And he says, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. See, what these super highways in our minds do is they make it so we don't have to think about it. We're just kind of drawn to that. We just have that craving for whatever it is we built up in our mind, whether it's food. And we build it in a trench that this is the thing that brings me comfort and solace and priority and everything else. And our mind just kind of goes to that, whether it's alcohol or drugs or tobacco or pornography. See, we built up these pathways in our mind that our mind just goes there because of the pleasure sensor, because of the pathway that's been created over time and over use. So I really don't have to think about it anymore. That's just kind of where my mind wanders, down the path of least resistance. It says we've got to stop that. We have to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. As a Christian, we can't afford to let our minds just wonder about anything. We can't just let our mind wander free about anything because it's constantly creating these pathways based upon what we're thinking and what we're doing and how we're living. If you continually choose to give yourself over to something, you create this stronghold to become so powerful that it's almost impossible to tear down and destroy. Almost impossible. 
Because with the things that seem impossible to men, they are possible with God. He can make all things new. But the first thing that you and I have to do is we have to completely stop using that pathway in our mind. You can't continue to run down the pathway and expect for it to be overgrown again. I'm amazed at how quickly even some of these highways can become overgrown without use. You go back and look at some of these towns because of one thing or another around the world that was quickly vacated and nobody used anymore. How quickly the grass grows up through the concrete and how quickly the trees and the brush and everything else grow over. That doesn't happen unless the pathway stops being used. And the same is true in our minds as well. You have to stop using the pathway. You've got to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. You have got to understand that this is a warfare of the mind. And if you give yourself to wander down that path, it's never going to overgrow to where it's not being used anymore. You've got to completely stop this pathway in your mind. That means completely ridding all access to pornography in your home. That means getting rid of everything that provides access to it. You've got books, you've got magazines, you've got videos. That means cleaning it all out and get rid of it so it's no longer in the house for you to use. Okay, that means putting up safeguards in all of your electronics so that you can't access it anymore. I referenced Covenant Eyes in some of the research ahead of time. They have some wonderful software that will cover your phone and all your electronics. It will add filters, and so you have somebody put in a password that you don't know, and it has the filters of what you can access, what you can't access. It will send a report directly to a certain person's email, and they will be able to literally see everywhere you've gone on the internet, everything you've looked at. So you got to put up these safeguards. You need to have somebody in your life that can, that is regularly in your life that will, can serve as an accountability partner. That will have an invested interest in who you are to ask you, what, what have you been looking at? What have you been doing? How are things going? And they can be the one to review what it is you've been looking at. And so you've got to completely stop using that pathway, just as we looked at in Ephesians 4. You've got to put off the former. Okay, this, th this road that we want to get rid of is never going to be gone until we stop using it. Then you have to start to create new pathway in your mind. Psalm 119, verse number 11 says this, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. See, you have to begin to create new pathways, new superhighways in your life. You have to get to the point of studying and, and memorizing Scripture until you understand and have a new way that your mind thinks. Your mind is literally renewed and transformed. You have a new default path that you go down now. It's no longer about the filth and the immoral and the perverse sexual things. Now my mind defaults to Scripture. My mind defaults to the things that are true and right and lovely and a good report. You have to literally teach your mind that giving in to wrong sexual temptation is not a reward, that it's harmful. And there are a number of even secular studies that prove how harmful wrong sexual activity is to an individual, to their health, to their family, to their mind, to their relationships. But you have to retrain your mind. First, you have to stop going down the path. And you have to create a new path. Through His strength, through His power, it is possible to be set free from this filth. But only in His power and His strength and His way. And I would dare say, according to statistics... This topic right here affects a lot of people in this room. Whether you want to admit it or not. 
whether you're willing to be honest or not. Statistics tell me this is not the only Baptist church in town where this is not a problem. It's not the only church where we're absent from all of this. It's here too. If David can struggle and fall, you and I can struggle and fall. We've got to be honest with ourselves and honest with God. This, and say, this is a problem I have in my life, and you have to be willing to take the steps. And that means humbling yourself. That means confessing. That means getting help from your spouse, from your parents, and taking the proper steps to cut off this highway and this pathway and to begin to build a new pathway, a pathway that thinks about the things that the Lord wants us to think about. I don't know what it is that may have you in chains this morning. But I know the God that I serve. He is a God with all power that can set us free from all things. 